All right, sorry again for the carryover into this second video here. But we're having this issue where, you know, we, we were trying to set up and, and solve whoops, um, this matrix equation, and it was just telling us no inverse existed, but it's a square matrix. Why wouldn't that happen? So what I did is I went back to, like, okay, how do we actually find the inverse other than using the inverse button on a calculator? So I put our, our matrix A on the left. I put the identity matrix on the right, just like what we did back here. Okay, where we put our matrix on the left, the inverse, or the identity on the right, excuse me. We change the left to be the identity, and our right becomes the inverse. So what I did is I extended, oops, don't see that, don't peek. Um, there we go. So I extended it to do that augmented matrix. So now I'm going to quit and I am going to go, oops, let's quit out of that too. I'm going to go matrix and let's use that reduced row echelon form from before. So I'm going to choose to do reduced row echelon form with this matrix A, the augmented matrix A, where we've got the extra identity at the end, and let's see what happens. Okay, this is what I get. Oops, I'm on the wrong page. There it is. All right, so what do we notice about this? Well, if I was to draw my line for my augmented matrix, it would be right there. And remember, our goal when finding an inverse matrix is to make the left the identity matrix, so the right is our inverse. However, when we told it to do reduced row echelon form, did it give us the identity matrix here? No, it didn't. The identity matrix would have one there, one here, and a one there, zeros everywhere else. It wasn't able to do it. So not every square matrix actually has an inverse. Okay, we weren't able to do this. So what does that mean about this problem, though? Remember, we have the system we wrote. Okay, what does it mean for us about this system that we don't have an inverse? Well, now I'm going to go back, and it's been a while. I mean, it's been weeks since we've looked at this with our break and everything. Um, but what if I were to graph it, right? We know when there's just two variables, we look at the graph, we find where the two lines intersect. But what does it mean when we have three variables again? So what I did is I went into GeoGebra, <clears throat> and I graphed our three equations. And I want you to be reminded here that an equation in three variables like x plus y plus z equals 216 is a plane. It's not a line. Okay? So I graphed all, all three of those, and we're only seeing one plane here. But we've got some pretty big numbers. Actually, the plane we're seeing is this bottom one, negative x minus y plus z equals negative 8. That's that one right there. See? Now you see it. Now you do. Or now you see it. Now you don't. There we go. <laughs> all right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out. Oh, here comes something else. And what do we notice here? I see the three planes. Tell me about their intersection. Their intersection is this line. There is not one single point of intersection. The intersection is a line. So how do we respond to this? How many points actually are in all three planes? And the answer is... There are infinitely many solutions. Any point on that line is going to work in these three equations. So I wanted to wrap up um, our videos here dealing with systems with a, with a problem that reminds us sometimes there are infinitely many solutions. Sometimes there's no solutions. Three variables, you're looking for the intersection of the planes. All right, so I hope that was uh, kind of an exciting cliffhanger at the end of the last video. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. For me, it was exciting. Um, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you later.